<laughs> <laughs> Say cheese, right? <laughs> Always. <laughs> or bees. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everyone and special welcome to Frank, our speaker for this evening. Uh, this is our, our uh, November meeting for the Houston Beekeepers Association. And this is our last meeting for the year. I know that it's gone so fast um, and we have overcome so many things this year. We've become a virtual club pretty much overnight. Um, and uh, I think we've had some amazing speakers. So I'm really excited that Frank is going to round out our year together. As usual, we have some quick announcements. Uh, then we'll turn it over to Frank to be our speaker. And then of course, at the end of our meeting, we have our virtual door prize uh, raffle. So please hang in there for us at the end. Have some special things too for the holidays. One thing I want to share with each of you is every year we want to find out what you, our members, think about our speaker series and what types of things you want to hear about in the future. So we will be sending out a survey to get your feedback on the speakers that we have had this year, as well as what do you want to hear about for next year. Now, of course, we may continue to be virtual for a couple more months as we get into 2021, but we will hope that by at some point next year, we'll get to see each other in person again. So fingers crossed. Um, but in the meantime, we've had some amazing speakers that probably wouldn't have been able to join us in Houston um, because we're able to do this virtually. So put on your thinking caps, please share with us your ideas as well as we're going to also be asking if there's anything anyone would be interested in contributing their time to HBA. So if you are interested in writing articles for our SCEP, interested in um, supporting our Facebook or YouTube pages, we are looking for you. So um, please share if you're interested in helping out on some of those things. It can be a lot of fun to communicate with our members and answer those questions uh, throughout the year. Also, we're going to be kicking off a new HBA holiday t-shirt campaign. So for those that were not part of the recent campaign, I think we did in July, August, maybe it was October. Um, we're gonna open back up our t-shirt site on uh, bonfire.com and I will post that link to Facebook so that you can get to it. And so just like last time, we have to have at least 17 orders for those uh, shirts to be shipped out to you. And of course, there's all types of t-shirts, all kinds of sizes um, for your big beekeepers and your little beekeepers. So um, stock up on your t-shirts. They make great holiday gifts. And of course, um, a small portion of each sale comes back to the club. So take advantage of that. Um, I know a couple people uh, really were looking forward to getting some more t-shirts before the end of the year. So with that, those are kind of our announcements for this um, meeting. And I am gonna turn it over to Frank. Now, Frank comes to us from Ridgewood, New Jersey, um, avid beekeeper and educator, as well as author of um, his book around uh, bee people and the bugs they love. And so we're really excited to have him today. And so I will turn it over to you, Frank. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And those t-shirts look great. Um, they are. I have a, like half a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> I wear them beekeeping a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, here, let me get my screen share here. Um, but yeah, the, um, thank you again to everybody that, uh, for letting me be part of your last meeting of the year. And uh, I am happy to say that I have been to Houston, um, so I'm familiar with your area. A good friend of mine used to teach at uh, University of Houston Clearwater, um, so it's been several years since I've been down there, but uh, I have experienced uh, your beautiful town. Uh, but uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, we can see that, right? <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, I, I call this uh, from bugs to books and um, we'll get started. So the I thought since um, you're in Texas, I should start with 
a little bit. What is beekeeping like in New Jersey? So New Jersey is the most densely populated state and I live in the most densely populated county in that state. So if you look at where it's really red in the upper right hand corner, that's where I live. And uh, which means it's greater than 5,000 people um, per square mile that live there. And sometimes being here is very Jersey. Uh, for those who remember, this is the Sopranos and uh, a lot of where they actually filmed that show is where I live. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it can take on a certain flair that you have seen on TV. But uh, more importantly, what beekeeping is really like in Jersey is uh, New Jersey is known as the garden state and um, it's a beautiful place to keep bees. The picture there on the left is me with my super hive that I had a few years ago. Um, and that hive, it had, I think that's like eight supers it had on it that year. So for me, it made 240 pounds of honey. Um, the one in the middle is me catching a swarm and in the background is Manhattan. Um, and then just to show how uh, it can be pretty secluded is what the picture on the right is. So where I start is, uh, well, why, why beekeeping? How did, I, how did I get into it? And the truth is, is I never knew anybody that had bees. I never was around bees, but there was something uh, inside of me that wanted me to be around stinging insects. And I also wanted to be part of a group. I wanted to be good at something. I wanted somehow to define myself and the traditional ways that people do that just never felt right to me. Um, but I was always looking for that, my, my group, my people. And so then I saw an ad in a local weekly paper that said at the local library, they were gonna be having a talk on beekeeping. So I went, I went to this and uh, the thing that I was surprised most about that in New Jersey, that there was actually a beekeeping club. And that surprised me because I was that, you know, living where I am is about 15 to 20 miles outside of Manhattan. And so it surprised me that there was enough beekeepers in my area that could actually make up a club and a club that could meet monthly. Um, but apparently there was. And so I, I, that led to me joining it. And then when I was in the club, it was, it was not a well attended uh, uh, organization. You know, the, the meetings were like nine to 12 people and they tended to be like these, these old guys that I think uh, were about three or 400 years old. And then uh, just kind of the macho cowboy type that, you know, hey, look at me, I don't have to wear any uh, veil or anything. Uh, and the meetings were always very disorganized and they weren't helpful to new members. Um, and so I don't know why I kept going back when I describe it that way. And then I, I, uh, after a couple of years of that, there was the Cub Scout true uh, sleepover that changed everything for me in beekeeping. And this is, so I have a son, he's now 17, but when he was in Cub Scouts, they had a sleepover at a, an aquarium in Connecticut. Now, when I was a kid, as I'm sure many of you, a sleepover was outside in a tent. But uh, apparently now that that's a little bit too much to ask. So the Cub Scouts do these sleepovers inside. So this was in an aquarium and uh, my son and I actually slept behind an otter exhibit and so I want you to imagine sleeping on a cement floor and you're in a room with about 15 other eight-year-olds and their parents about just what a fantastic environment that would be to get a good night's sleep. So since I obviously couldn't, I did what all beekeepers do when they, uh, you know, in a situation like this, I thought about bees. And so as I'm laying on the floor and feeling my back spasm in my head, I'm like, you know, the bee meetings really aren't that good. What could we do instead? And so I thought up like, okay, here's the 12 months. What, what topics would I want to hear and when would they best fit? And so as, as um, the noises of the aquarium uh, and the noises of the eight-year-olds kept me up, I was able to kind of come up with this uh, calendar and potential speakers in my head. And I just kept that um, with me until I got home and I wrote it out and I, I emailed all these people. 
and said, hey, do you want to, you know, come and speak at our meeting? And then they said yes. And I did all this on my own. And then so when I went to the, uh, the next B meeting, I'm like, hey, look, I have a calendar for next year. And then they were so excited about this that they elected me president of the club. And so the big moral of this story is, if you ever want to get elected to an office, go sleep on a cement floor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> agreed. <laughs> So it sounds like you have slept on a floor as well, Sandy. And that's why <laughs> not quite that bad, but you know, as soon as you have ideas, there's always people to help you express those ideas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so once I was president, I wanted to grow my club and I wanted to make it better. And I did have all these ideas, but like any club, there's two things you need. You need to have money to do it and you need members to make it worthwhile. Now, around these, the same time, I had some major changes in my personal life. I went through a big, nasty divorce. So I was only seeing my son about 50% of the time. My future love of my life was still in Sweden. So I had all this time to myself. And it's like, well, what do I do when I have, with all this free time I now have in my hands? Bee talks, of course. And um, being in New Jersey in such a populated area, like there's 70 over 70 different municipalities just in my county alone. And so if you think of each municipality in each school district and then each garden club and each everything else, there's a lot of people that are looking for uh, bee talks all the time. And so that became kind of my, um, <laughs> my sometimes weekly habit was to go give a talk. And it was a great way for me to raise money for my club because I would take the donation and give it, you know, to have it made out directly to the club. And it was a great way to uh, drum up more people that were interested in beekeeping, as well as just for non beekeepers to understand all the cool facts and things about bees that we all love. And then the thing is, is the more of these talks I did, the more requests I got to do more talks. And so I kept getting better and then I kept getting more requests. And what was happening was every time I did it, my bee talks kept getting better and better and better. And that's because if I, I, if I couldn't answer a question quite right, I would think about a better way to say it and how to answer it. And I tested the next time. And then when it worked, it just kept getting cleaner and more polished. And then my explanations got so people were like, I got it. And because I kept doing these talks, if I didn't know an answer, I had to go research it. So my knowledge of bees just kept getting better and better. And so the end result of me doing all these talks was it, it actually made me a much better beekeeper. But then after literally 125 of these talks, I just asked myself, why am I doing this? How many times can I say the same thing? And why does everyone always ask the same questions? And I took a deep breath and I said, you know what? People laugh at my bee jokes. Um, and I, and I love to do the same bee jokes over and over again. Um, and one of my favorites that I like to do is when I'm talking about, um, how, you know, Queens get mated in the drone congregation area. And then, so I set all that up that the queen goes up to there and the drone congregation area is like a big, it's like a singles bar. So you have all these males just hanging out and waiting for one available female and, um, then, you know, the queen, when she's up there, she'll mate with up to 24 drones, which to many in the audience may be a typical Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people seem to laugh at it. And then, uh, and then I like to talk about, you know, then the drone's only job is to mate with a queen. And then a lot of times, you know, guys will be like, yeah, they go, and then they die afterwards, but they do die with a smile on their face. <laughs> and so I, I try to focus on the positives and I said, you know what, even though people are always asking the same thing, maybe there's just more I can do to, to make it even better. And uh, one of my favorite beekeeping jokes that is also a, a truth is if you ask three beekeepers the same question, you're going to get five answers. And that's because there's so many different ways to do it. And yeah. what I was finding in my club, though, was that all the answers were seen on the same level. And then you had all these, what I call YouTube aficionados who would say some pretty crazy stuff. 
And yet people would bring that forward like it was on the same level as common mm -hmm. sense or science. So I realized I needed to do something to kind of set myself apart from just any of the other opinions. And that's why I decided to uh, enroll in the Cornell Master Beekeeping Program. And another true funny story is I literally signed up when my wife was in labor at the hospital. Um, and I do think it was because she was euphoric knowing that uh, our baby girl would be there soon is why she let me do that. But uh, it was you know early, so the labor pains were pretty far apart and it wasn't at the get this thing out of me stage yet. Uh, but I just, for me, I knew that if I, there was something that said, if I don't sign up right now, I'm never going to sign up. And so I just felt compelled to do it and, uh, and, and got in the first class that Cornell was doing. Mm -hmm. So just a quick pause. I want to make sure that everybody knows what the true test of a master beekeeper is. Being able to drink your coffee through your veil. See, I was going to say keeping the smoker lit, but that's better. <laughs> <laughs> but so the way the Cornell program is set up, and, and I talk about Cornell, and I, and I would encourage people to look at any um, educational program. There's some great ones out there, like in addition to Cornell, you know, University of Florida has an excellent one. Um, but, I, you know, the, the more education with bees, the better. But Cornell is relatively close to me, um, and, and I could go into why, why else I liked it. But uh, the way it's set up is there's four distinct courses, and it's over a 15-month period, and each course focuses on a different aspect of bee biology or beekeeping or something like that. So the first course, each course has a project, and, and the first course's final project was write an outline for giving a speech to non-beekeepers. Uh, and I'm like, I've been easy. doing this, you know, 125 plus times. And so I sat at the computer and bam, it was the easiest thing for me to write. It took me about seven minutes to do. And then I actually tweaked it. So I had one for kids. So, you know, maybe eight minutes if you count both versions. And that made me realize, hey, that was easy. Mm -hmm. And I really credit the Cornell course because it really made a light bulb go on my head. And I'm like, hey, if I can turn that, you know, if I, it was so easy for me to write this outline, you know, maybe I have something to say. So I turned that outline into an article for Bee Culture and I emailed it in and then Kim Flodham wrote back and he said, hey, there's a lot of good information here and he published it. And then that was the first time I had anything published. Mm -hmm. So I wrote two more articles and he published both of them. So I went from never have writing anything and getting published to having three published in bee, bee culture in less than a year. And so it was kind of at this point that I realized that um, all of those talks I had done was kind of like the karate kid with wax on and wax off. And I didn't realize how much it had helped me, but it really gave me my voice on how to explain beekeeping. And more importantly, is that people liked my stories. I was getting a lot of positive feedback um, and, and I wrote more beyond those first three um, in mostly in bee culture, but I also did one uh, for Cornell as well. And, uh, and then each one I did, I was able to just get a little bit more of who I was out there. And then that's when I decided to write my biggest and best story, um, which is my book, Bee People and the Bugs They Love. <clears throat> and so just a quick what people are saying that uh, Tom Seeley reviewed it and uh, he said if the world of beekeepers has a top ambassador it's Frank the bee man <laughs> bee people is a delightful portrayal for non-beekeepers of what life is like for those of us who are always thinking about bees and then I was lucky enough to have the New York Times review the book back in the summer and the review said, it is an achievement to convey so much knowledge so accessibly without seeming overbearing. Mortimer intersperses useful facts about his passion in a successful and funny book that is sure to swell the ranks of the world's beekeepers. And the San Francisco book review said, this ranks among the best written books I've ever reviewed. The book includes great humor, use of allegory, um, 
and be people are a weird and fascinating lot. And yes, we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> and the author delves deeply enough into their eccentricities to make it for a fascinating read. And uh, Kim Flottam, obviously I had to have him review it. And uh, he just talks about how I capture you the first bee meeting, the first bee sting. And he said, read Mortimer's book. You'll become, before you become a beekeeper, he gets it right. And be nerd alert, you'll meet some of the best people in the world, beekeepers. And um, what was great about him using be nerd alert is throughout the book, that's what I call um, their little boxes that go a little technical. So the, the book is meant for a general audience, but when I want to go deeper or you know, more for beekeeping stuff, I call it a bee nerd alert. So it stands it out a little bit more. Love that. Well, so Kim joined us last month. He was our speaker last month. Oh, that's great. Yeah, he, <laughs> he's awesome. And then uh, finally, Tammy Potterhorn, which this is a wonderful book on a side note is Bees in America. Um, if for those that may not be familiar with it, that uh, Bees in America, how, how the honeybee shaped a nation. And she mm. starts with back in England before the colonists came over and uses chronologically to the present of how honeybees help shape our country. And it's, it's a fantastic book and I highly recommend it. And um, she is the state apiarist in Kentucky as a, a, who she is. So, and anyway, so she says that I've conjured up the eccentric beekeepers from every corner of the world, including yours. Um, and then, oh, and then finally, if for those that have Netflix, The Stranger, the, um, the series, The Stranger, that's written by Harlan Coben. He's a New York Times bestselling author, and I love his dad jokes. And he said, uh, be people in the bugs you love is the bee's knees and getting a lot of buzz. Be smart people and read this unbelievable, interesting look at the quirky world of beekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the big question is, what makes my book so special? And the thing I want to emphasize, it's not a how-to book. There's too many fantastic how-to books out there. This is more of a laugh at the mistakes that I've made book. And it again, spotlights all the quirky offbeat people that are obsessed with the honey love and bug. And you know, that's the thing is that more than just about Apis mellifera, it focuses on the people, the people who love to hang around with stinging insects. And um, you know, I always say is that like, think about when you're meeting or just hanging out with a few beekeepers and you start to say in some of the crazy stuff that's happened and telling stories, and then somebody will say, man, somebody should write a book about all this funny, crazy stuff we do. And that's what this book captures is all those stories that we love to laugh about and laugh at ourselves about and what we do. And that's what I like about beekeeping is that one, it's kind of like this international fraternity and that wherever you go, I mean, here I am across the country from you and we're all on the computer talking about bugs. And that just shows what a crazy yet connected group we are. And uh, a few years ago, I went to Sweden and I did what you're supposed to do when you go to Europe. I connected with a local beekeeping club. <laughs> and so what I loved when I was over there is that a bunch of them didn't speak a lick of English, yet we were able to communicate because we were all doing the same thing and we were all looking at the bees. And what I love on this slide here is one of these pictures is taken in Sweden and one's taken in New Jersey, and we're doing the same thing. It's, this, it's the same activity. And that to me, I, I think really is profound that the activity that we love, beekeeping, really transcends any kind of language or boundaries that exist in this world because all that matters is the bees. And so uh, just some, on a side note, some of my favorite beekeeping words, my ultimate favorite is their word for honey super, which is Scott Lauda, which is a translates as treasure box. Now, the whole reason why I do these talks is actually that I want us to stop calling them honey supers and start referring them to treasure boxes. Because <laughs> what an awesome thing to call them, right? <laughs> and then uh, their word for beekeeper is biolare, and then honey is honung, 
and then queen is Drottning B. And then my favorite for smoker is Rock Pust. And Rock Pust translates as smoke pusher. Makes sense, right? Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you got to ask yourself that, you know, so here I've, I've been to Sweden and then, you know, they say, ah, it's the same thing here, you know, us beekeepers are crazy. And it's in a good way, right? And it's like, but why, why are there all these characters that you see in the world of beekeeping? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, and I think it's because we're, we're individuals and we're nonconformist. And, you know, some people might call us weird, but we really just like to be ourselves. Um, but the thing is, is that you see these certain types of characters in beekeeping wherever you go. Every club has them. And when I go through these, you're gonna say, yep, I know exactly that is, that's John or Sally or whoever. And the funny thing about these characters is they don't even realize that they actually are a type, but they are. So the first one is the spaceman. You know this guy, this is the one that, he's in beekeeping because he loves to play dress up. When he was a kid, probably cops and robbers and everything else. So now he's into this, the space suit of wearing a veil from head to toe. He is covered. There's not one piece of him that's exposed to the bees. And that keeps him safe from honeybees, plutonium, and zero gravity. The next one is the show off. This is the guy that loves to perform for a crowd. He, he always talks about the shock value of keeping bees. And the more you listen to this person talk, the more you hear them say about the stings than they do about the honeybees. And then there's the new age know-it-all. This is, this is the dude that's into um, crystals and uh, weird music. And it's like, hey, forget science, man. You just got to think like a bee to be a bee. Good vibes, unicorns, and feng shui is how I keep them. You got to be the bee to understand the, what's best for them. But my all-time favorite is this guy, Michael Smith of Cornell University. Um, he was one of Tom Seeley's graduate students, and he did an actual scientific study to see where on your body it hurt, stings hurt the most. So to do this, he, he, had, he picked 25 locations all over his body. And I want to be extremely clear, all over his all body. All over. All over. Um, and he had to sting himself three different times in each of those locations and measure the pain index of what hurt the worst. And um, to use the scientific terms, one of those places was his dingle. Yeah. <laughs> but out of all... <laughs> Out of all those places, what he found was by far the most stingful, uh, painful place to get stung. Are you ready? Inside the nose. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look this guy up, he actually won what's called an Ig Nobel Award. And it's kind of like a, a, a spoof award that's done out of Harvard every year. And it's like kooky scientific experiments that are funny, but also make you think. Um, he is now a PhD and he's doing his research in Austria. <laughs> Gosh. But only a beekeeper would do that because our normal is so much different from other people's normal. <laughs> and I think the best way to talk about a beekeeping normal is when we catch swarms. You know, and that, like this picture on the left is when I caught one in my downtown you know, the police have it all roped off, you know, and so nobody can get hurt. And then I just went in there with my cardboard box, shook him into it, and then walked back and put it in my car. And below the pictures is I took a screen grab from my town's Facebook page. And because somebody had put pictures up and then this person commented, that dude's crazy. He throws them in the trunk of his car like it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was funny that the picture with me and the officer, I'm carrying, this is another swarm I caught, and I, I had them in the cardboard box, and he goes, you know, total like cop speak, uh, what are you gonna do with that box of bees? And I said, well, I'm gonna put them in my car. 
And then he did like this three stooges thing where he's like, Whoa! <laughs> and then his whole body shook. And it took, made me feel so fantastic to have a police officer get the willies because I'm putting bees in my car. <laughs> but for us, that's nothing. And, no. um, and it's also, you know, just some more of the, what our normal is, is that, so I have a, a, a honeybee playlist. It's up to about 25 songs and each song has to do with either honey or honeybees. Um, and I usually have that go into my car as I'm driving from my different uh, bee yards and also when I'm extracting honey. And then with my family, our normal's different from other people's normal, you know, when you're three and you have bees in the house, you want to show your baby doll. And uh, my my uh, two daughters love when I uh, when drones come back in the house with me so they can play with them. Mm -hmm. So the one picture is uh, my daughter petting a drone that was uh, back in the house. But I think what I like most about beekeepers is that we make great friends. Um, you know, who else but a beekeeper is willing any day, night, weekend, or holiday, your phone's going to ring and it's going to be a beekeeper asking you a question about bees. And of course, if they, they want to talk bees, you want to talk bees. And I think the reason that beekeepers make good friends is that beekeepers are nurturing people. I mean, if you think about what we're doing is we're caring for tens of thousands of bugs that want to sting us. And it's not like a dog or a cat or something that's going to love you back. And so it really takes a special type of person that wants to nurture an organism that doesn't necessarily love you back. And uh, these are two of my favorite cartoons. The, the, the full color one says he likes to take him indoors for the winter. Um, and then the other one is uh, the beekeeper in bed. And he turns to his wife and says, OK, but it's fine for you to grade papers. And uh, <laughs> But the nurturing thing is also why I think it, beekeeping is great uh, to do with your whole family. This is my brood. I have a, a son and, who's 17 and then a, a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And beekeeping is something that they, they all enjoy doing. Um, my three-year-old got her bee suit from Santa this past year. And she is, loves to come out in the hives with me too. And it's just special that we do. And that's because beekeeping really defines my family. It's something we do together. We bottle honey together. We like to go out and do the different fairs together. And it's what keeps us close as a family. And that's why I'm proud to call myself a bee people because of how much I love my bee people. So thank you very much. That uh, is my presentation. And now if you want to open it to questions, I'm, I'm more than willing to do that. Absolutely. So uh, everyone on the phone, you're welcome to unmute and ask questions. You can also put questions in the chat box for Frank to respond to as well. And this uh, are different ways if you want to follow me on social media. I have a question, uh, Frank. Yes. Uh, I also speak to a lot of groups, um, particularly children, um, and uh, you know they always want to know about the girls and the boys. And then I'm talking about drones. How do you <laughs> explain uh, bee sex without talking about bee sex? <laughs> so, it's, it's a good question. So it's when a I slippery do... slope, you know. <laughs> so when I'm talking to kids, I say marry. I don't say mate. And then I say <laughs> the queen bee will go and marry up to 24 drones. Oh. <laughs> and then when that, but the one thing is when I, you know, then the boys die after they get married. And so <laughs> they'll usually get, well, why do they die? And I go, well, I don't know. That's just the bee thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I will say that I, I take great pride when I'm talking to, you know, I do a lot of, it seems like third graders around here, I do a lot of third grade classes and I, I, I get them like, you know, I get them worked up and saying how like, you know, the boys, they don't do any work and that uh, uh, they just, you know, the girl bees feed them. And then so all the little boys are going, yeah. And then I twist it around and, and then by saying how a hive is all girl power, 
And it's yeah. just so fantastic. Then I watch all the little girls going, yeah, girl power. <laughs> and then this one time I had, um, there was a um, kind of a bigger boy sitting in the front and his arms are crossed. And he, he goes, I want to be a girl B. <laughs> oh, I love him. I love him. Yeah, it's, so, it's well, that's you, how I do it. I just use I, I use the word married. <laughs> As someone who's not married. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm still a virgin B. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else has questions? <laughs> All right. Any other questions in general? It sounds like Frank may be a wealth of knowledge for general beekeeping questions. What kinds do you guys have? Uh, oh, can I post the 25 bee songs? Um, yes, I can send that. I can send that to Joe. And then, um, awesome. oh, here, I'm just, I'm going, I'm going to scroll up through the questions here. Um, yeah. How many pages is your book? It's about 305, I think. 304. Yep. How was that? Um, <laughs> and yes, so about I took my bee suit. I did actually bring my veil when I when I went <laughs> to Sweden. So that's and it's funny, my in-laws who are wonderful people, but they are not into bees at all. And then I show up at their house and I had my bee veil in the luggage, which led to some great looks. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'll post the, the bee songs that I have. Um, and yeah, that's all the, does anybody else, you can write more messages because I'm looking at those if somebody would prefer that. Um, I just wanted to ask, how are your girls doing right now? Are you uh, are you in winter dearth or are you having yeah, any? So, so Jersey, what's interesting where I live is that they go from April to July and then pretty much are in the dearth after July. Some areas will get a September flow. Um, do you all get Japanese knotweed? That plant? So yeah. it's an invasive species. So gardeners hate it but bees go to it like crazy. It. And it's actually, um, it's a member of the bamboo family. So people here will sell it as bamboo honey and it has a real dark reddish look to it. Um, mm -hmm. But if you can't get the, the, the Japanese knotweed, then that's it, you're, you're in the dirt. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, so we've been in it for a while. So we start preparing for winter as early as August, just to make sure that they're, wow. that they're heavy enough. Yeah. Wow. Um, I have a question. Um, are you doing an audio book as well? Yes. The audio, they, um, my publisher has that already arranged. So we'll, cool. it, they have, who's going to, who's going to, it's not going to be you. No, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I was excited that they're doing it. So <laughs> cool. And, and how did you like, what, how was the story of like getting a publisher? Like how did that in a very like quick uh, story. How did that go? Like, did so, you just so uh, I wrote the, it around? I wrote the book first, mm -hmm. and then, um, and I, and it, it, it's funny that I I worked in Manhattan, so I took the train to work, and I did a lot of the drafts, like just going to work on my phone, and then took it back to the computer to rewrite it. But um, then, so when I was done with it, then I had to uh, find a literary agent, so I had to shop that around and then once I found the literary agent she sent it out to like six publishers and then out of one of those sixes I got mine nice and so in the book you know I'm assuming it kind of covers the basics of beekeeping but but you tell us what does it focus on so it's it's my story and it starts right before I start beekeeping through to um the bee club and some of the stuff of 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 what a bee club does in the honey cup, the honey tasting that we do. So it, it, it has all the basics, but it goes, the things that I think a beekeeper would like is, um, I have a chapter on Varroa and just why there's such a problem and how to deal with it. 
Um, so I, especially with the be nerd alerts, I do try to go deep at times for people that have knowledge and then, but make it accessible to, to people that have no knowledge as well. So it's kind of um, knowledge based, but also telling a story, right? Kind yeah, of yeah. also a bit of the entertainment because we have plenty in dealing yeah. with stinging insects. Um, yeah. you know? and, that, <laughs> and that's just it. It's like, you know, like we'll joke about, you know, like I talk about different times, like my major times I've gotten stung and yeah. just how funny that is, you know, and then, you know, when you tell, as I'm sure all of you here have had conversations with non beekeepers about getting stung and they look at you like you're crazy. Like you're crazy. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, and that, and that's, you know, a big part of what I wanted to do was, uh, I, I guess I'd say I wanted to do two things. One is I wanted to make people laugh because I think it, it, it's important to be positive and enlightening. And then two, I wanted to, to, to talk about the actual science of bees because there is so much bad information out there. Mm -hmm. So everything that's in the book, I really, that's bee related, I really researched to make sure that it was as accurate and up to date as possible. Yeah. So now let me ask you guys some questions. So um, tell me like how much honey do you average per hive and, and what's your honey season look like? Well, I can tell you mostly about our seasons, which are much more extended than those in New yeah. Jersey. In fact, I think we just wrapped up doing the, the last of our second harvest, the end of October. Um, exactly. And, you know, similar to, um, you know, in New Jersey, it really depends, you know, um, on the environmental factors, how much honey um, each, you know, colony or apiary um, really does produce. But we do get two harvests sometimes. Um, so usually we see a harvest, you know, June, July, and then another one um, in um, October. Now we've also seen in, in recent years harvests as early as April, which was great. Wow. Um, but it just depends because we're pretty warm. We don't have to do too much work over winter um, just to make sure they don't have too much space, you know, for when it does, um, when we do dip into more cooler temperatures. But of course, we don't really have much of a freeze here in Houston because we're so far south. So, um, members on the on the conference on the on the phone, how much honey did you get this year? Anybody want to share? Uh, I got about fifty off of one of them so far, but we are probably going to harvest one more time, and about forty off the second. Wow, that's nice. Yeah, that's that's pretty much like that would be the average for Jersey as well is around 50 per hive. And we it's just harvest today. Wow, well, that, it's amazing you guys are harvesting right now. I am envious about that. <laughs> now, is it much different in color from the, the first to the second? Yeah, so the spring, what we call spring honey is lighter, uh, much lighter in color as well as in the taste. Um, it's much lighter. Um, uh, sources, usually wildflowers and vegetables and kind of those spring um, blooms. And then in the fall, it's much deeper, much richer, um, and a darker amber color, usually. Now, this all depends on where the apiary is. Um, we usually get our invasive species is called the goldenrod, um, which no, 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 our, no. goldenrod is everywhere. Is it's it everywhere, but uh, it's considered invasive, but the bees love it. So. Our, 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 our main nectar source in Southeast Texas is the Chinese tallow, which is an invasive species. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, sorry. And, um, and so we have those as well, but the bees love them. So, you know, what are we going to say? We're not going to cut them down, at least on my, my watch. <laughs> so, but yeah, the, uh, the fall honey is darker, um, usually has more, um, you, know, uh, you know, nectar from uh, tree sources and things like that. So. See, so it, it's interesting you say that. Like, so in Jersey that we get, I'd say primarily is from trees because it's all suburbs and there's a lot. So we have like a lot of linden trees mm -hmm. and also black yeah. locusts. Mm -hmm. That linden honey is delicious. Love yes. it. Yes. Yeah, and it has like that sort of a citrusy flavor to it. Yeah. And uh, in France, they refer to the linden tree as the lime tree, which mm -hmm. I think is interesting. It explains the 
the taste. I mean, it's not a citrus tree, but that's what they call it, the French lime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's so like in Jersey. So this year I averaged uh, 130 pounds of honey per hive and yes. I harvest um, twice as well, but I harvest once in June, like the beginning of June and then once at the end of July. Mm -hmm. And just like that six to eight week difference can get me, um, it doubles my honey and the colors are also different as well. Last year they were more distinct colors, but this time they are a little bit closer. Yeah, we've had some monster hives this year. We've had a banner bumper crop year. So yeah, I've had one hive over 300 pounds, a single hive. That's great. It was wild. <laughs> Go bless you. <laughs> Well, and um, many of our beekeepers, you know, um, kind of similar to you are within the Houston city limits. And so, you know, within the metro areas, we often see a lot more blooming longer because, you know, everyone wants those flowering plants and flowering trees. And so there's actually quite a bit of, um, you know, of, of forage here within the city, which is spectacular. Yeah, there's, there's some anecdotal evidence or stories that urban centers actually the honey is is tastier because it's more yeah. diverse so right. Houston New York Paris Toronto they're all saying the same thing so that's yeah. great um, yeah. there's a question from Richard if we're regulated in Jersey and the answer is yes and what's great is that it was done at the state level so by the state putting laws into effect municipalities can't just do a, a knee-jerk reaction and ban beekeeping and that was the purpose of the state law. And then the Depart New Jersey Department of Ag has a set of regulations of what you have to do. And it's mostly about being a good neighbor. Um, and then like, so the state beekeeping club works very closely with the state Department of Ag. So like I wrote the uh, frequently asked questions that helps define what those regulations are. So yes, we're regulated but it's a good thing because it keeps everybody doing it, keeping bees in a way that is not gonna set a, a bad tone um, or create a dangerous situation. Which, so two more questions for, for you guys. My, my first is, since you're so warm, are hive beetles a big problem? We do have our fair share. I don't know that there's, you know, a hive anywhere that I know that doesn't have at least a couple. Um, but I would say most, you know, strong hives, you know, deal with them um, as a, a regular, you know, hygiene task, right? Keeping them at bay. Uh, but I would let the, the group also share their thoughts. Yeah, they thrive here. <laughs> 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 they definitely thrive here. <laughs> I mean, when you hear about Florida and how bad hive beetles are, that's why I asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's, it's pretty like consistent. Here. Um, but here. there's all, and there's all kinds of ways in which people, um, you know, try to uh, dissuade them or, you know, put them in the sun, put them in the shade, use oil. So it really, you know, depends on the beekeepers, um, what they lean into to keep, keep them at bay. Gotcha. And my last question would be, um, is there any issues with Africanized bees? Anyone else want to jump in on that one? They exist. They're here. Um, <laughs> I mean, I feel like they're a bigger problem further south than us and further west than us. I mean, we do come across them here, but it's not like, a, like I've never seen them. So. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they've inbreeded so much into the local populations yeah. that, you know, we, we tend to see, I would say, probably spicier colonies, um, you know, here in our area. <laughs> spicier. Call Just them like spicy. A, like um, Tex <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, they can have some temper. Um, you know, if you compare, you know, just, uh, I would say your real uh, clean genetic Italians or other European types of, of, of lines. But at the same time, those colonies that are a little spicy, we see produce really well. Um, and they can also be much more, um, uh, I guess, able to 
um, deal with mites and with small hive beetles. Now we're always on the lookout for those that are too spicy, right? Like you can't even open them, you can't get close to them. Those, you know, we manage and get rid of. But um, you know, over the years, they've they've inbred so much in the local colonies. We find that those um, those traits that came with them actually have been more useful to our feral colonies than um, than than harmful. So, but to Nicole's point, we probably heard more of it in the West Texas, South Texas, where they can get a little bit more remote and be and, and those traits get much more aggravated. So. Um, but of course, every once in a while we hear it on the news and everyone assumes that they're, you know, Africanized, but um, it's very rare, at least for me and, um, and us to, you know, run into a hive that's just so, you know, aggressive that it can't be dealt with. You know, usually if they're spicy, it could be genetics. It also could be their environment that's, you know, kind of keeping them testy. Sometimes yeah. when you move them, all of a sudden they're like the best bees, you know, they were really testy where they were. And then you move them somewhere else and like, ah, this is better. It's fine. <laughs> so it just depends. Gotcha. And then now Stan asked a question, what queens do I run? Um, so I, I generally go with mutts that uh, I get, like this is going back that, uh, but my bees, my primary source is a commercial beekeeper in New Jersey. He's New Jersey's largest commercial beekeeper. So he breeds for honey production. So I prefer his queens. I have tried other ones. Like um, it was funny that at a UPS um, facility this summer, like, a, uh, like where they transfer different packages that not once, not twice, but three different times, they broke a Man Lake package that um, had Saskatraz uh, uh -huh. in it and so they called me to come take the bees for free and I, every time i go i hand my business card i'm like anytime i'll get bees anytime day or night i'll come get them and and it's like because they're freaked out by it but um so i i do i did try saskatraz this summer because of that i didn't buy them uh i was really impressed with them they like they definitely are very mellow um they're pretty dark and uh the only um negative is that they really move quickly like they're runners so when I like to mark my queens and then to to find them before I marked them even after they were nice and plumped up and were laying I sometimes had to go through the frames a couple of times before I could find her and then and then catch her to, to mark her but uh but yeah I use I mutts as my 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 preference yeah good questions all right. Well, while we have Frank on the phone and other beekeepers, any other general beekeeping questions? Yeah, I'm happy to answer anything about um, beekeeping courses um, or or anything else. And I and I love to talk about my experiences in Sweden as well. Um, so if anyone has any questions about that, and one cool fact since we were talking about um, honey production, because they're summers they have you know and i'm not talking like super far north it's it's like midway and down in sweden their summers they have about 20 plus hours of daylight so oh, wow. their, their bees are constantly flying so like yeah. it was great when i was there i was going after work for the beekeepers so it was six seven o'clock at night and i kept forgetting because it was so bright it was like an afternoon in jersey and mm -hmm. uh just fascinated me that the bees will work like that. And so they're able to actually bring in a, uh, between 50 and 60 pounds. I mean, that's the conversion from kilos yeah. of, um, over there. And um, the, the other thing that which you'll appreciate in Houston, because I appreciate it in Jersey, is that Sweden, which is significantly colder, mm -hmm. their idea of what's cold for their bees is much different than ours. Mm -hmm. And so like they will do an oxalic acid dribble um, when it's 32 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. And they'll just dribble the, this wet syrup on their bees and they think, and it's fine. So uh -huh. crazy. Wow. All right, so what advice would I give to a new beekeeper? Um, well, in, obviously since you're here, you're already doing my number one tip is to join a beekeeping club 
because I think where you see new bee beekeepers fail is when they try to do it without connecting with other beekeepers. Um, my second advice is to, to pair up with a mentor um, so that you can, and, and make sure you're asking questions, but to have somebody with more experience than you just to look over your shoulder as you do it is a great way to, to, to kind of give you some tips along the way. And my third tip is that as you're going into winter right now, pick up some how-to beekeeping books. Um, my, my favorite is the, the Beekeeper Handbook by Diane Samataro, I think is how you say it. Um, that's, if you're gonna get one how-to book, I think hers is the best. If you wanna get more than that, I do love Kim Flottam's books as well. Um, and that's my three tips. The next question, <clears throat> do, they, do they live shorter lifespan running that long a days? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know that, like, it seemed. I, I can't. I don't know that answer, but I, you know, but what's interesting too is their winters turn it around. Like where my wife is from, she only has. They'd only have sunlight from like 9:30 a.m. to 2 p.m. and the rest of the time it's dark. So their brood breaks in the winter are longer than ours. And I think that that's why they're able to, they have mites, but they don't have the problems that we have in Jersey. And I think that's because that long brood break right. helps them uh, can keep it under control. So they only have to treat once for mites. So in Jersey, because we're so densely populated, my mm -hmm. club now has 260 people. And so I always say everyone's bees touch everyone else's. Mm -hmm. So I'm treating now at least three times a year, sometimes four for mites. Um, is Tom Seeley an interesting dude? Uh, Tom Seeley is awesome that, um, <laughs> he, uh, he, re and I'll tell you, he is the two best speakers. So you were going to ask for speakers, yes. the two best speakers that, that I ever heard was Tom Seeley and Jamie Ellis mm -hmm. and, uh, and Jamie's from university of Florida, but Tom, he's, it's funny when he's up on stage talking he, he'll, you just, you could hear a pin drop because he's so interesting, but yeah, yeah. when it's more one-on-one -on -one is where he gets very, very shy, but yeah. uh, a, a wonderful human being um, and just really cares about people. And when he signs his book, he draws a little B in every single book. And it doesn't matter how many people are there, how long it takes, he draws this perfect draws little B. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Yeah, we had Jamie earlier this year, so. <laughs> you had everybody. <laughs> Joe, our uh, vice president, has been working hard. We give him, you know, the list and he, he hunts down the speakers. So, but, I, you know, I think it's so much more accessible now that we, you know, do this virtually. We really can, you know, talk to anyone, um, you know, about bees. And um, it just makes it it's so much easier and accessible to both the speakers, but also us here in Houston. And I'm trying and the, um, the other good one uh, from Florida, or excuse me, from Georgia, I'm blanking on his name, um, but University of Florida and Jennifer Berry, um, it's it, Jennifer Berry's boss and Jennifer's also great too, uh, mm -hmm. University of Florida, or University of Georgia, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what other questions for Frank or general questions out there? All right, going well, once, you. going yeah. twice. All right, thank you so much, Frank. We really enjoyed this and can't wait to see the new book. So when does it come out again? March 30th. Okay, we're Next gonna, month. we're definitely gonna get that one. I already ordered the um, one about bees in America, coming to America. So. <laughs> yeah, you'll enjoy that one too. I like but, that. But thank you, everybody. And when things get back to normal, I would love to come down to, to Houston sometime. So who knows? Maybe we can make that happen in the future. We would love to have you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Pack your veil. <laughs> <laughs> Pack your veil. <laughs> <laughs> I will. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Frank. <laughs>
All right. Well, that wasn't that wonderful. I can't wait to read his book. I think it'll be fun. I love to hear beekeeping stories. We are a little weird, but we are lovely bee people. So, all right. So now comes the exciting part of the end of our meeting, which is our virtual door prizes. And we have some great ones today. So we have a beekeeper Barbie for those that have little bees at home and you need a gift for Christmas. Oops, it goes like this. There is a beekeeper Barbie up for grabs. She's really cool, by the way. Um, then um, an HBA t-shirt and then one of our uh, beetle boards. So Nicole, would you like to run the numbers and see who our lucky winners are? I have pulled all the names and like normal, they have left. Um, so uh, our first winner who will get their choice is Susan Lowen. She has been on, she was talking before we started. So I know she's, she's around. Let's see. She went dark. Susan, can you hear us? Or Colin, I know you're there. <laughs> uh, what's the name of his new book? It's called Bee People. Bee People. I guess Susan is, uh, you know, left left her crafting room. So she gets, she's going to miss out. If you hear us, Susan, and if you're just trying to figure it out, come in at any time. All right, let's go again then. Um, the next person, they keep leaving me. All right. Kyle Clay. <laughs> he won last time, but he won again. Kyle Clay. Hello. Hi, Kyle. You get Hi. your choice. <laughs> Again. Cool. Uh, what is the board again? I wanted to know what a beetle board was. I never heard one. So it is a actual um, kind of, uh, how can I explain it? It's like a little box at the bottom where the beetles drop in and then they get caught so that it takes care of your small high beetle problem. Okay, I'll Just get one of those, please. Okay. All right, Kyle gets the beetle board. Awesome, awesome. I got it down. And then we have, man, you guys can't stop leaving me, I swear. I'm on <laughs> my sixth person now. <laughs> I think I'm gonna have a problem. Okay. I'm gonna have to start over. Sorry about that. I thought six for three prizes would be enough. <laughs> Apologies, everybody. Oh, I see Susan. Susan, can you, are you, she's there, but she's not there unless she can figure out. Susan, you won. Hello. Hey. hey. There you are. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> so you won one of these things. Oh, not one of them. You won a, either a beekeeper Barbie or an HBA t-shirt. Hmm, what a decision. You know what? <laughs> I want the beekeeper Barbie. I have six granddaughters. <laughs> That's exactly why I have her for our Thanksgiving giveaway. Cause I thought this would make a really good Christmas gift for somebody's little beekeeper. Yes, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. And our final winner is Corinne Maddox. Hi. Hey, congrats. Um, you're <laughs> going to get a t shirt. Hey, okay, yay. <laughs> I better write that down. So All right. Funny. Cool. They're very handy. They you are. can wear them anytime, but I do wear them beekeeping. <laughs> All right. Good morning, one of those. 
<laughs> All right. We're All good. right. Well, uh, Joe will connect with you guys to get the uh, raffle prizes out to you. And um, our next meeting is going to be in January. So we have a bit of a ways. You guys be safe and enjoy the holidays. We will miss you in December, but we'll be back in January with brand new speakers and another fun year. And hopefully 2021 will shape up to be a little better than 2020. We can only hope. So, thank oh you. yes, it's it is the wrong date. <laughs> you oh, haven't. It's twenty twenty one. Your brain is still in twenty twenty, Santi. Yeah, which is I can't get out of it. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in between now and then, if you have any nominations for the board, please email us info at houstonbeekeepers.org. We um, are looking forward to our business meeting. Our election will be in January. So, yes, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. And we'll have Let's to celebrate it. Kristen's birthday too. <laughs> Love it. Sure. You know, you can you can win a position on our board for your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. You guys have a wonderful holidays, and we'll see you on the other side. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>